Hey everyone, this is Dawn Marie, Silver Associate at 7K Metals, and I really wanted to do a talk on some of the things that are in plain sight, but most are not seen. There's a term called normalcy biased out there that means that your head is in the sand. We're a little bit in denial of what's going on out there, and I have a great friend that is so knowledgeable on this topic, and uh, he has been a silver stacker for about eight years, and um, he is really good about um, just sharing, simplifying things that are out there to make it easy for everyone to digest. And he has some important things he wants to share on the importance of precious metals. So I would like to um, um, welcome to the show, his, he's going to leave his name anonymous for now. So we are going to go with the name AG Leveraged. So AG Leveraged, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Don. How are you? Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday to you, too. Thank you so much for taking some time out to talk to us because you are brilliant in your information, and I know everyone's going to be really uh, informed by the information that you offer. So first off, why the name AG Leveraged? So AG obviously means uh, silver. Um, and then leveraged, there's a term. Uh, recently we hear an economist saying how the average American is over-leveraged. Um, so over-leveraged means that we're overextended. Um, as, as an example, uh, recently I had a friend who showed me his $1,000 phone, and he said it only runs me $60 a month. Naturally, I didn't ask him, well, ultimately when you're done paying for the phone, what are you going to pay for it? Um, the same is, can be said for an RV and sea dues and motorcycle and pretty much everything. We don't buy anything cash outright. So we tend to be overextended and overleveraged. So it means that we're living on a lot of credit, that, that we have a lot of debt. Um, mm -hmm. So AG leverage means that we're backing some of those so-called debt, some of those credit cards, uh, with an actual uh, metals in the same manner that central banks do. Central banks uh, and banks in general are – they should have between 10 to 20% of metals to back the derivatives market, all of their equities, all of their paper, whether it's actual paper, we're talking fiat money, or whether we're talking about the variety of financial programs that they offer. And so too should the average American. We should have, it's my belief, at least 10, if not 20% of what we consider to be our assets that we actually hold in our possession in precious metals to back all of those personal derivatives that we have. Hence the name AG Leveraged. I love it. So this week we've had a pretty big week of some different things going on in the economy. Um, and the president came out to California and, uh, you know, he's saying that our economy is strong, and yet I hear a lot of economists saying otherwise. Where do you feel we're at? We're, we're in such a unique situation. Uh, the bummer is that between Monday and Tuesday, between the day before yesterday and yesterday, $128 billion was flushed into the banks. Um, that's not a good thing. They're, they're not calling it QE. Um, had they called it QE, you would have seen the dollar fall slightly and you would have seen silver go up probably 2 or $3 in a single day. So they're, ve they're being very careful about how they're terming this liquidity. Um, because the Fed cannot be audited, we really don't know uh, what backs that, that, uh, that liquid that they've put into the banks for use. Um, there's, there's, there are short-term loans that occur between these central banks and very large institutions and sovereign countries where they do short-term lending between themselves in a high dollar denomination of somewhere between 2% or so. And what ended up happening is that that percentage, that interest rate, went up to like 10% because of lack of fluidity. Hence the reason why they needed this injection immediately. Monday's injection wasn't enough, so Tuesday's was necessary. Um, this does not speak of a sound economy. Um, putting that aside, if we just look at the average American family, um, I, I think it was Forbes that I was reading that 
the average American doesn't have four to five hundred dollars cash to use on anything right now. So that goes back to the people are overextended and over leveraged in their lifestyle. So we may drive a particular car, we may wear a particular suit, um, but insofar as cash is what we have, we don't have it. We tend to pay for that same cell phone and gasoline and a restaurant and all these things based on, on credit. It doesn't matter what it costs. What matters is what does it cost me per month? And exactly. so, And so from that perspective, the economy isn't strong. Now, if we look at the numbers and we look at unemployment, if we look at the numbers, now these are the numbers that are provided to us by our government. If we look at the numbers of, of unemployment of our inflation rate, we tend to feel pretty good about where we're at. However, if we were to get, if we were to use the, the same criteria that was used in the 80s or even in the 90s, our, our interest rate would be significantly higher than, than what they're telling us that it is, as would our, our, our pardon me, our inflation rate, as would our, our unemployment be vastly different. Um, case in point, regarding our, our interest rate, um, what isn't counted, I'm sorry, regarding our inflation rate, pardon, what isn't counted is the food that we consume or, or our medical or our education. But there's a lot of items that have been removed that if we were to put them into the equation, we'd see that the inflation is significantly higher than what, than what, we're, what we're told. And I think we're, be, we're, we're beginning to see it as we go to the supermarket on the weekend and we come home with two or three bags and it's, it's already $100. And Absolutely. It, and it does, it, it isn't necessarily steak and lobster either, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And really quickly, um, explain to everyone what QE is. At the very beginning, you mentioned QE. So quantitative easing uh, is a term where money is printed and it's injected. So what it is is that um, the, the Fed gives money to the central banks, who in turn give it to the smaller banks, at, at a particular interest rate that then is supposed to uh, it's, it's supposed to uh, spruce up the economy because then all, all the construction that takes place, all the cranes that take place, all the investment in new business, in, in the purchase of a property, in the creation of a, of a new business, all of that is done through debt, through loans. So the more liquidity that those banks have, the more prosperous uh, an economy can be uh, because there's cheap money available for people to, to spruce up business. So that's the theory behind quantitative easing. You flood the, the banks with cash, and, and, and in turn, they, they create an economy that becomes robust because people go out and they take a chance and they start a business or they do construction and they do remodeling and, and so forth. That, that, that's, the, that's the mindset behind that. Uh, the, perfect if I may, perfect sorry, definition. But, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna, there's a caveat to that it actually reduces the purchasing power of the dollar because the more paper you have out there, the more fiat, the more dollar you have out there, the, the, the higher the inflation out there. So, so let's pretend that we have access to cheaper money out there. How does that serve us if the gallon of milk goes to $10 a gallon, the gallon of gasoline goes to $10 a gallon, and the, and the average hamburger goes to $20 a burger? So yes, we'll have, We'll have access to easier money, but in the end, we'll pay for it with through inflation. And they never explained that to us when they brought out QA, QE in 2008. That when they flood it, the, the flood it flood us with that that the dollars in our pockets are going to be worth less. That's correct. Now keep in mind, the last time that was done between 2008 and 2011 we were able to export inflation because we're, we were, we're still the world reserve currency. In order for countries to purchase oil, they still need the dollar. And that's still the case uh, for a lot, a lot of, uh, of the world. However, between Russia and China and Venezuela and uh, Saudi Arabia, they're now buying and selling uh, oil in gold or in the, or in the Chinese yuan, the renminbi, if you want to call it. And so, at some point, we're going to feel that as the dollars come back home. Um, now, interestingly enough, you have about three trillion physical dollars out there chasing approximately ninety trillion dollars of of world debt. So the dollar is still a very sought after uh, 
money. It still remains, it still is king because all of that debt is trying to pay down some of that interest rate on those loans, on that $90 trillion that's owed. So right now you could call it the cleanest of all the dirty shirts. But if you were to say, what's the actual inherent value of the dollar? Uh, well, uh, again, it's still world reserve currency, and again, it's still used for the purchase of petrol and a lot of goods and services the world over, certainly in Latin America and so forth. But does it have that strength it once had? No. Is it backed by silver and gold? No. Is it backed at this second necessarily by oil, land, or, or American assets? No, it isn't. So for that reason, the importance of stacking precious metals is, is so huge. It's so imperative. Well, I know that there's some countries like Argentina, Brazil, Iraq, and most of the European Year, uh, Union, they're going through some challenges um, during this economic time. Um, and what do you think we can learn from these things occurring in these countries? So let's look at uh, Argentina. Let's look at Brazil. Some of these countries have, in order to shoulder their, their social programs, their welfare programs, their unemployment programs, their disability programs, what they've done is they've raised the taxes on the working people. So when you, when you raise the taxes on the working folks and you redistribute their wealth into the non-working segment, ultimately you go through uh, what Venezuela is going through right now. Argentina is potentially facing that right now, depending on who becomes their next leader. Brazil is certainly in that right now. Iraq is going through some massive inflation. Um, you know, in the European Union, you have Deutsche Bank in Germany, who's I, they're they're being floated, they're being kept up by by sovereign countries that are that continue to inject money into a bank that's that's way over leveraged. It, it it has I don't remember the exact number of derivatives that it holds, but I would have thought Deutsche Bank would have gone out of business six seven years ago, and yet it, here it is still. Um, but, but Spain and France, France and, and, again, most of the European Union is, is again, heavily indebted. Uh, they have a lot of social programs that they're paying. Uh, the people are very overtaxed. Um, you have the, the yellow vest movement occurring in the European Union where people are sick and tired of working for nothing, and, and they see their neighbors are not working. So uh, right now here in America, we have a lot of social programs that, that are being paid for, and what people don't ask themselves is, well, we all want to help. We all want to be conscientious of someone who's down, down and out. But when it comes to just plain mathematics, where is the money for some of these programs going to come from? Do we print our way out of it? Do we sell, you know, Donald Trump's already mentioned uh, the 50-year bond and a 100-year bond potentially. You know, these for the most part are, are, are less than B-rated. They're going to be. They're, they're almost going to be junk status. Argentina went ahead and introduced a 100-year bond recently that now uh, defaulted. It's, it's, it's insolvent. So all those yeah. people who invested in that direction, they went belly up. And in this case, what they're, what they're planning on doing here is, is trying to get institutional money, pensions, 401Ks, deferred comp, into uh, uh, the new 50- and 100-year bond to float us out even further, to expand the debt even farther. So what we're talking about is you have three credit cards that come due, and in order to pay those interest rates, you get a fourth credit card to pay for the interest on those first three. And that's really what we're talking about. That's what these wow. other countries have done around us, and that's what they're suggesting happens here. And, and you know, there, there's the, the criticism that says, well, we have the military-industrial complex. Why don't we reduce the monies there? That's easier said than done because that, that tends to run our country and tends to run most of the globe for that matter. And then there's another side that says, well, why don't we tax the elites? And when we say the elite, we're talking gentlemen like Elon Musk and uh, um, uh, uh, the, the owner of Microsoft. Sorry. Uh, 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 anyhow, the elites, all of them. Um, but the truth is they have their, their tax attorneys. They have their accountants. They have um, – they have people who protect them and defend them and ensure that they pay very little on taxes. So my point is the ones who get the brunt of the tax increase is always the working middle class American citizen. That's the person who pays for the existing social programs we have and then the ones that are being proposed. And whether that's um, the greening of America or whether that is um, 
the, the new programs that, that uh, for, for, for new folks that are coming into this country or, or anything in that direction. So ultimately what I'm saying is that we can only afford what the working middle class American citizen can afford to pay. And the question begs, how much more taxes can we undergo? So with all that in mind, the importance of holding savings, not in the form of paper, not in a bank, but in our home, in our possession, uh, is just crucially important. Again, based on that's what, what I was just going to ask you. I was like, okay, so that's that's the bad news. That's where we're at right now. But what's the silver lining? And you know, going into the gold and silver, why is buying precious metals so important in this environment? So again, uh, our, our goal is to back our own derivatives to be as responsible as the banks should be. In other words, if you were to say to me. Um, I have this much in assets based on my home, my car, and personal things that I have. I have a million dollars in assets. I would suggest that you work your way towards having at some point at least $100,000 of precious metals in your possession. Now, you might say, wow, that's, that's a big climb. Well, yeah, but it's done <laughs> one coin at a time. One of the yeah. reasons I'm a fan of 7K metals is – it doesn't require you to have the discipline to go out looking for the metals. It's just you can put, in, you put yourself on an automatic uh, delivery once a month to your home. And depending on, on, on your ability to invest in your own savings, uh, you know, it could be as little as $100 a month. It could be more than that. But if it's constant and consistent, it grows, and ultimately you get to your goal of where you want to be. Um, but I just think it's crucially important. If you look at history, that's – those are the folks who fared well during a tough economy. And we all want abundance. We all want the, 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 the beauty that America has. We love everything it holds. But if in case tomorrow we overprint and we're, we're over leveraged as a country, then we want to be in a position where our families and, and, and we're, we're, in, we're in a sound position where we have three to six months of, in case things get, get slow, of savings in the form of precious metals in our possession. And what's going to happen as far as precious metals when things get slow? So I, I mentioned a moment ago that if, that if the Fed was to refer to this uh, injection of $128 billion as QE number four, um, that the silver market would have an impact immediately and, and they would climb pretty quickly within a single day. Um, remember, gold and silver is what once backed our, 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 our fiat dollar. It used to be a silver certificate, and before that it was a gold certificate. Right now it says on top of it it's a promissory note. In other words, it's an IOU. And it even says on the very top, um, it says Federal Reserve note. In other words, it, it's, it's their note. It belongs to them. So with every dollar that's printed, it comes with interest. So it's already, you, we owe that dollar plus more dollars in order to pay for that first dollar that the Fed loaned to our government, which was then used for, for our country. Um, so it already, it already comes as a debt note. What offsets that completely is gold and silver. They've always been the, the one that tells us where the dollar's at. That's why the manipulation of these metals has been so crucial. And, and the word manipulation is a big word because that accuses a group of actually controlling the price of, let's say, silver. In this case, silver is the only commodity on the planet that has never been subject to inflation. Not at all. Uh, it's been at, at almost $50 twice in the history of silver. And yet here we are in 2019, and it's, it's, it's under $18 an ounce right now again. Um, I can talk about all the, all the uses of silver as an industrial metal. Um, it, you know, I can talk about how little physical silver there is above ground. I can talk about how all the mining companies that have gone belly up, they've gone bankrupt in the last few years, or they've gone in the direction of gold because silver has been, uh, it's been a commodity that isn't worth digging up out of the ground. The average mining company is spending between 13 to $19 to get it out of the ground, depending on where they are in the world. And so with all that said, the precious metals must climb when 
the paper when the dollar when the fiat gets gets hit when when a fiat dollar always get it gets hit the, the gold and silver which is the true money rises and in this case even more so because the silver itself is not just being hit on is not just being has the pressure from the industrial side of it uh, but also because there's so little of it there again um, when the price goes up I won't deny there's going to be some silver that's going to come out in the marketplace from people who've been holding it. Maybe they bought it at 19 or $20. I've been buying it since it was higher than that, and I've had no problem doing it. Um, but silver stands to go up significantly from where it's at right now. Mm-hmm. We, don't want that, we don't want that to happen because that means that the dollar will get hit, and that means that we're going to be subject to some form of stag- stagflation or inflation. And we'd like everything to stay abundant the way that it is right now. But based on, on, uh, on Keynesian economics, where you, you try to print your way out of a tough time, the inevitability is inflation. Therefore, silver must climb, as will gold, obviously. Incredible stuff. And you recently came to 7K Metals, and I wanted to find out, You know, you are so knowledgeable about all this information. So why were you drawn to 7K Metals? Why did you say yes to 7K Metals and grab a membership? So I've been looking for something like like 7K Metals for a while. Um, I I love the platform of of 7K Metals being a wholesaler. Uh, There are many, many wholesaling companies, but they suffer from liquidity. Um, they can only be so much of a wholesaler because they need that cash influx, which is what creating this this uh, multi level marketing, bringing that portion of the business into a wholesaling idea. That's how that works through the memberships and through the monthlies, the monthly uh, purchases of, of, of the precious metals that are delivered. The company is able to bring in the cash flow necessary to run logistics to have a good uh, good technology out there, to have a, a, a business that can then reinvest into itself. And I was impressed by the, by the 7K Metals platform. So I've been buying precious metals for a while, so I know what costs what. I know deliveries, I know taxes, and I know what I can spend at my local brick-and-mortar uh, wholesaler as well. Based on all those things, 7K Metals is a brilliant move. The average American does not have the time to go look for a brick and mortar. They don't have the discipline to get online and shop for metals that are going to be delivered at their home. So being a club member of 7K Metals is brilliant because then it takes all that energy and time out of the equation, and it's an automatic delivery to your home once a month. And you fill up that shoebox as soon as you can, and you work towards a second shoebox. And people have said to me, they've said, well, you know, I don't know if I want to keep precious metals at my home. It seems like such a risk. Um, having done this for a while, I've helped uh, clients in the past. Uh, I'm a builder by trade. Um, store metals behind the refrigerator, behind their stove, behind uh, places that no one would even consider. You know, the average thief comes into a home and he looks for the, the top drawer of the bedroom uh, you know, cabinet system, or, or he goes into the closet, or he goes into those places. But you'd never think of going into these other places that are a little more technical to look for. Some people say, uh, you know, I prefer to keep my, my savings in the bank because then it's out of my possession and it's safer there. I think under normal circumstances during a ripe economy, that is, in fact, the case. Uh, I, I think right now, uh, based on some of the bank runs we've seen over in, in Cyprus and even in Greece, uh, where, where I believe right now they can take out, I think in Cyprus it's up to 60 euros a day, or Argentina, I think it's about 300 pesos a day. Uh, when the banks start controlling the amount of paper money that you can take out through an ATM on a daily basis, that's when you would look back and say, man, I wish I would have had some of that in my possession. Um, so so I, I don't know if I answered your question or not, Don. I think I went on a tangent there. Well, also when the dollar, um, when the currency that they're using it, um, collapses or is devalued, then you're going to want to have some silver and gold on hand. You are. Uh, again, if we look at uh, the decline of, of any civilization, and I'm not saying that the American idea is over. I'm not saying the American empire is over. I love what we have. I love our independence. I'm a big constitutionalist. 
I believe in God, I believe in work. All these things are valuable to me. Um, But I also see some of the things that we're having to do in order to extend this idea further. And I see what some of these other countries are doing. Uh, Again, the average American family is overextended, but I think we're following suit. We're following the example of our local city, of our local county, of our local state, all of which tend to be insolvent. They're broke. They cannot afford their own pensions, of our own federal government for that matter. You know, right now, uh, we took in $3 trillion in taxes, and, and we spent $4 trillion. That's the way we're working as a country. So if that's what our, our mother country is showing us as an example, then that's, that's the reason why we're also all overextended, and we're very comfortable in debt. And that's, uh, you know, that's a misnomer. We, we should not be comfortable in debt, and yet we are, right? That's become the new normal. And, you know, change is inevitable. So the silver lining on all this is just to be prepared to realize there are consequences to decisions that have been made over the last hundred years and that it's not that things um, have to be bad necessarily. It's that things are going to change. Nothing stays the same. There is no stagnancy in life. And so things will always transform. And we can transform it to positive, but we need to stay on top of it. We can't be in denial of what's going on out there. You know, Donna, you make a, you make a really good point. Many people believe they're going to be rescued by their president, by their state, by their government, by the economy. Um, and the reality is it all really falls on, it, on each individual, on each one of us, to be responsible for ourselves. Now, in, in stacking these precious metals and silver, uh, the beauty is that we can get into the collection portion of it. It doesn't have to be a chore. It doesn't have to be a stressful thing. We get to learn about the world over when we start collecting precious metals from foreign countries. We get to learn about their history and their economics and their political system. And those things are intriguing. Um, so this can be something that's a beautiful hobby while we're busy saving, while we're busy investing, while we're busy uh, protecting our families. It doesn't have to be something of burden, right? And absolutely. And what I have found is cash burns a hole in my pocket, but stacking silver, I can keep it. And it's something that crosses all generations and that has mass appeal from the age of five to 105. Don, years ago, I was, I was seeing a client. I was in Malibu, and I was a young man. I was a, a young uh, German uh, kid with his mom, and he asked me. He was, he was much younger than myself at the time. I was 30-some, and he's probably 20-some, and he asked me in a German accent. He said, well, how much, how much silver do you have? And, and I said, what are you talking about? And my answer was, and I, I became a little overprotective, and I said, I have CDs. I have mutual funds. I'm comfortable. I have properties. I didn't understand what that was, and, and we're taught by our society, by our government, by our educational system, and certainly by our financial planner, that we want to be in stocks and mutual funds. And most of us, as our saving grace, we have our 401K, we have our properties, we have equity in our properties, and that's our definition of savings. But beyond that, we don't have any other form of savings. Oh, this young man took the time to tell me, hey, listen, this is, this is what's, what's going on, this is what's real. He said, well, what are those mutual funds dependent on? What are those CDs based on? He said, well, how is your stock market? At the, top, the time, the stock market was certainly healthier than it is today. You know, a stock market right now, if you look at the um, American companies, whether it's Tesla or AT&T or, or Amazon, uh, the strongest American companies are super over-leveraged, super indebted in the red, and if they weren't subsidized by our, by our federal government, they would have gone belly up a long time ago. I'm a business owner. If I ran my business in that manner, I would have gone bankrupt a long time ago. But these companies enjoy the slow interest uh, on on loans because the lower the interest rate goes, the lesser they pay on their on their debt, and the more debt they go after. So the point is that you know all of these systems that we believe are to protect us are pensions, or four hundred one ks, or our deferred comps, and all these things are dependent on these companies that are way over leveraged. So provided that we still have an expansionary system and that debt's always readily available at a very affordable price and we can continue to count on that. But if that isn't the case, then we must look in the mirror and be responsible and say, my God, I've got to put some of this away for myself. Just in case these third-party managers, maybe they're not always acting on on my behalf. And, (laughs) And again, sorry, go ahead, Don. 
No, I was just laughing because, of course, they're not acting on our behalf. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, sometimes so I have friends, they're police officers, they're firemen, and, and uh, they'll say to me, you know, uh, that isn't the case because our financial planner tells us this and that. And then we, we turn around to find out that the, the financial planner is also overleveraged. He's also following the same methodology, and he's got his RV and his sea dudes and his motorcycle, and you know he's again over leveraged on all of those things. So, so even our own experts that are telling us how to invest and they're guiding us, they're in the same position as our federal government. They're in the same position as our as our, our, our local county, our local city, and so somewhere along the line, we have to face the truth and say, okay. Uh, we're going to have this much in derivatives, in debt, in credit cards, and so forth. We need to be able to back that with some amount of precious metals that we house in our possession. Um, so, so there. Yeah, cover yourself. You know, make sure you become informed and learn this information. So I want to thank you so much for being, as Robert Kiyosaki says in his new book, Fake, a real teacher, because you're teaching about real money, not what the dollar is, which is just currency, or essentially could be like monopoly money. So thank you so much for taking time out. I would love to invite you back uh, to talk more and just continue this conversation. Is that possible? Anytime you want, Don. What a pleasure. Excellent. And for those that are listening, if you like what you hear and you would like to be part of this team on 7K Metals, I'm going to uh, put down a special link where you could become part of a, a AG Leveraged Special 7K Metals team. So thank you again for joining us. I hope this information has been just fabulous, opened your eyes to so much information and enlightenment. Thank you again, AG Leveraged. Don, have a beautiful day. God bless.